Hey, you guys, welcome to Hanging with Langan. Got my bells, I'm all ready to go. Uh, back to my belfry. Maureen Langan here. You're watching Hanging with Langan. And this is my little chat show where I chat with everyone from academics to alcoholics, because why leave anyone out? And fun, heart, smart. That's what we try to bring to you. I couple the journalistic background that I have with the comic and try to bring you a show that is uh, has wisdom and wit. That's the goal. So I'm excited because in, in a moment I am going to be chatting with a woman named Valerie Lappin Ganley, who directed and produced a documentary called Shalom Ireland. Yes, Shalom Ireland, about the history of Jews in Ireland. So I'm very fascinated with that. I'm going to give you more details in a moment. If you're watching this, would you please, well, if you're not watching it, how would you know? But if you're watching this, share it. Just share this. Just let people know, hey, start a watch party. <clears throat> this way, this is how we grow the numbers and the audience. And that's what we do. And if you can't watch all of it, Patreon, Maureen Langan, Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, is where you can see all the videos of the shows if you miss any of them here. So what I want to tell you is my mother is from Ireland, not Jewish. She, though, um, I have Irish citizenship. I love that. So here's the deal. I've been in Ireland many times, and I discovered this place called the Irish Jewish Museum. Uh, and I went with my cousin, Andrew, who's one of the funniest human beings on the planet. And we arrived there on a Friday. <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> and the sun was going down. So they won't let us in because it's the Sabbath. And Andrew says, ah, Mo, 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 we come back when the sun's in the sky. <laughs> Just such an Irish way of putting things. So I'm gonna start with a clip here. It's such a great conversation. And there is a fella long gone to God named Robert Briscoe. And he was, my understanding, a gun runner for the IRA. And he was the first, he was a Lord Mayor of Dublin, which is a ceremonial uh, role, more like an ambassador is how I see it. And he was the first Jewish Lord Mayor of Dublin. And here is his son, uh, Joe, who also went to God a few years ago, but was in the film Shalom Ireland, talking about what it means to be an Irish uh, Jew. Here we go. My father used to say that Jews had the facility of picking up the best qualities of the wider community in which they lived. Uh, for instance, uh, the German Jews were inclined to be a bit arrogant. Uh, the British Jews were inclined to be a bit pompous. Uh, the American Jews were inclined to be a bit boastful. And he said the Irish Jews were the friendliest Jews in the world. They also, unfortunately, drank more than any other Jews. So there you have it. That is the opening of the trailer of Shalom Ireland about the history of uh, Jews in Ireland. A little stereotype there about the drinking, but I'm going to play. Uh, also with the boastful, arrogant <laughs> American ones. So anyway, uh, joining me now, the producer, the director of Shalom Ireland, Valerie Lappin Ganley. Woo! Great to see you. <laughs> um, we're already getting comments and people say, hey Mo, I'm here. You need to uh, go to streamyard.com forward slash Facebook so that we can see your name associated with your comments. You don't, we don't want to miss a word that you have to share with us. Simple streamyard.com forward slash Facebook. Valerie, thanks for being with me, darling. Oh, it's such a pleasure to see you, Maureen. Been thinking I a lot during this pandemic and been kind of inspired to see how you've pivoted. <laughs> Ivanka Trump told me I had a pivot. Oh. She said, she said, pivot. I'm in a different way. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, no, whatever she tells me. She said, Maureen, pivot. And I said, yes. No. <laughs> you know, I've had you on my talk show when I was on KGO in San Francisco. And I'm just always amazed by the work you do and how down to earth you are and what you've been able to accomplish. So when I came across Shalom Ireland, there's so, so many stereotypes about I don't like St. Patrick's Day as a whole because I don't like 
the green beer, people getting drunk and beating each other up. And that becomes a stereotype of the Irish. And it makes me so insane when there's such a rich history of writing and the culture and the language. And then to come across knowing that there was this pretty large, relatively speaking, Orthodox Jewish community in Dublin in the land of pork. Let's talk about the start of the Irish Jewish community, particularly in Dublin and in Ireland in general. Oh, well, the history of Jews first coming out of Ireland dates back to a thousand years, but the... Does? Uh, <laughs> yeah, there is... Are you lying? What? Uh, yeah, no, I'm not. <laughs> you, really? There were Neanderthal Jews? Like, what was happening? Well, it was documented in the um, Annals of Inish Fallen. You know, the, the priests would keep these rec records that a boat came sailing from across the ocean um, with Jews bearing gifts. And it says that they were turned away. And that's kind of left up to interpretation what that meant. Were they sent away or just, or they just went back to where they came from? They were but probably that, turned away. That seems, tends to be a Jewish theme. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then the largest, inf then, then some Jews came during the uh, like 1700s. There were some traders from um, Holland and then, but the biggest influx of Jews came from Eastern Europe during the pogroms. Um, many Jews came from Lithuania, where my great grandparents came from, and established communities around the country. And the time frame, the the time frame of the pogroms were what the late eighteen hundreds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so your okay. I want, we'll get to your family in a moment. So they came, they settled in Dublin predominantly. I know there was a Belfast. A, a, yeah, there were there were communities in Belfast, um, Derry, uh, Waterford, um, Limerick, Cork. Um, and there were Lord's mayors in different cities too, not just in Dublin. So um, the, the Briscoes were the first in Dublin, but there were there was a Lord Mayor in, in Belfast who was Jewish, one in Cork. Um, really? One, yeah, yeah. I always I wonder what like what Jewish person is you know in um, Vilnius, Vilnius, whatever the capital of Lithuania is, and says, you know what? It sucks here. Things are tough. Let's go to a place where people haven't eaten since 1865 and things will be better. Let's go to the land of pork, which is against our religious ways. Like what part of them says Ireland's the place? Well, what part says any place is the place, right? You're look, The people are looking for opportunity. They're escaping from, from persecution. And interesting enough, so many people had left Ireland at that time. So I think Ireland, it was actually in a place where they needed people, right? So there was opportunities. I mean, it's all relative, right? Where you're coming from, where you're going, where you're looking for something for a better life, right? That's what immigration is all about. I know. Plus, you know, there were a lot of uh, apartments available if everybody was leaving. That's a, being a bit of a wise ass. So you found, here's a photo here, the Irish Jewish Museum. That's the sign. And if you are in Dublin, this is what it looks like. It's a former home well, I'll let Valerie tell you. Where's the Irish Jewish Museum? And yeah, it's a, a, an area called the. It's the Jewish community there, um, South Circular Road, and it was a, literally two houses um, put to you know together. And what I, you know, I'm not sure what the origin of the, the the museum was. A synagogue at one time. I'm sure Maureen, you went upstairs and saw that it's a beautiful um, sanctuary. You know where. People, where they had services at one time. And that was very common, right? You would, if you didn't have a, an established building or synagogue, people would worship in their homes. And that's still happening today. In Cork, there's been a little bit of a resurgence there. Um, for a while, the community sort of disappeared, but now there's an influx. There's this woman there who's a, her name's um, Ruti Lax, and she's a Klezmer musician and a playwright, and she's kind of revitalizing the community there, and they're worshiping in people's homes, and that's what um, my great grandparents were doing. Um, when I look at, I found the address, the address where they actually married, it was in a home, right? Um, and then later, as as the communities grew and they raised money, and then they built these beautiful synagogues, like the one that we have featured in Shalom, Ireland, the Adelaide Road Synagogue. It's just a beautiful building. Um, but yeah, that was very common. You sort of do it in people's homes, right? Well, assuming well, about that building there. Do you know what the name of that area in Dublin is called in particular? I, I um, the little uh, <laughs> well, that, that section of Ireland where the Jews call it um, Little I Jerusalem. Think. Is that right? Sorry, mm -hmm. somebody <laughs> 
Molly McCluskey Barber, she's saying, is that why there might be a tiny amount of Ashkenazi Jewish in my ancestry DNA? Absolutely, Molly. Absolutely. Um, but Molly, I need you to go look up what the neighborhood in Dublin is where the Irish Jewish Museum is located. Could you Google that for me? And my cousin from Northern Ireland, Katharina Cunningham, is watching. Woo! Um, so you are you did not know that your grandparents were Irish or you did? No, I didn't. I grew up in a Jewish family in Los Angeles, and I didn't know anything about my Irish background. When I met my husband, Michael, a staunch Irish American, I was so impressed with his pride, his pride in Irish culture. I kind of envied it. I wish I had that. Um, but So the first time I went to Ireland, we went together, and he actually found the Irish Jewish Museum in a guidebook. And so we were just curious, like, what what is this mean? What would be our what would be the blending of our two cultures? You know, um, so we're kind of amused and curious. And we went up, we called up, we phoned up because you know they're only open a few hours a week. Right? <laughs> it's all volunteer run. And uh, sure enough, these women said, "Come on over." We drove over, we got there, and these two ladies were standing outside, and they looked like my Jewish grandmothers. And I, uh, I you know, I had these memories of my grandmothers walking down Fairfax Boulevard. If you've ever been to Los Angeles, the heart of the Jewish community, you feel like you're oh. in, in New York or Israel when you're there, but these, they look like my grandmothers, they dress like them, they, their body types were similar, but when they spoke, they had these lovely Irish lists, but it was mi it, it mixed with Yiddish, and it was like very surreal. I'm like kind of doing a double take the whole time, where am I, what is this about? So they took us around the uh, museum and had so much pride, and I was really fascinated, especially with the Briscoe story. Um, with Robert Briscoe having been a patriot, fought, you know, fighting with. I want to get into him in a moment, if you don't mind, Valerie. And if yeah. you're watching this, you're listening. Uh, Valerie Lappin Ganley, producer director of Shalom Ireland, about the history of. Uh, Jewish people, the Jewish communities in Ireland. Here, we were talking about the Irish Jewish Museum in Dublin. And here's a little clip I have from that. Now, uh, you're going to see the Jewish man who runs the museum or is a, what is it, a docent? Is, do you really can call them in a place that's like three foot by five foot? <laughs> There's a lot packed into that little museum, though. There's it's mind-boggling how much is in this little place. It's mind-boggling how much is in there. And some of it's very funny from stuff like the uh, Guinness beer, uh, kosher in Hebrew lettering. That is hysterical. But there's also some very deep things about... Um, Jewish children being turned, being there for a short time during World War II and then being sent back. Um, a lot of heartbreaking stuff. There's a, there was a Catholic woman giving, a nun giving the tour when I was there because she felt she had to do a penance in general for what um, the Ca Irish, predominantly Catholics, did to not help the Jews, even though they were a neutral country. So here's a little clip, though. You can't hear the Irish guy as, well, they're both Irish, but the non-Jewish Irish guy, he's asking if um what happens if you are a lapsed jew so here 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 you go take a listen you may notice the table there which is symbolizes a friday night uh, table celebrated by most uh, orthodox jewish households uh, the lady of the house the wife usually says a blessing over the candlesticks do you find that those customs are, are, are still very much held to of course they uh, are the question what i mean is that obviously there's a lot of lapsed jews uh, a Jew can never lapse. The Jew is a Jew, no matter where, whatever he laps. Right. We have a phrase in Hebrew which says, Chaveirim kol Yisroel. That's Hebrew, which says, no matter where you are, a Jew is a brother to another Jew. And uh, that's been literally the way of the Jewish people over the centuries. I love how he says that. A Jew is a, a brother to another Jew wherever you are, you know? Um, so, Valerie, let's talk more about this, the museum. And then you were bringing up a, a fellow who I, I read a lot about, Robert Briscoe. Yes, the ceremonial position of a Lord Mayor of Dublin, but so much more. His history prior to that, I understand, I read his book, uh, his memoir, that he was a gun runner for the IRA. Talk to me about that, because he's one of the most famous Irish Jews of, I of Ireland. Well, Robert Briscoe is the son of a Lithuanian, of Lithuanian immigrants, um, but he was he was a staunch patriot. Um, am I on? Yeah, I'm not muted. You're on. You're on. You're here all week. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, as a young man, he joined the cause. You know, he he um, ran guns and ammunition with Michael Collins during the 
War of Independence. And then after Ireland won her freedom, he was elected to the Dáil, the par parliament, and served in that position for decades. Um, and then during that time, he actually also became the Lord Mayor of Dublin. They had this thing. You could be a member of parliament and also on the, the equivalent of the city council, the mayor. Um, but during the, another thing that was really fascinating about him is during the war, during the World War II, he um, went to Europe and bought these old clapped out ships and smuggled Jews out of Europe into Palestine to save them from the Holocaust. Mm. Um, this was illegal smuggling these people at that time. Um, but he was doing this as a member of the doll, a member of the parliament. What I found really interesting, um, Robert Briscoe, his story is so interesting. I got the book, it was out of print. He wrote it in 1957. So I went on a Libris, they can get out of print books. And I paid $20, it, it came from God knows where, and it had his signature in it. You know, the, I, the same thing happened to me. It was such a surprise, you know, buying a used book online like that, and it had a signature in it too, yeah. Maybe we're being scammed. <laughs> for real. <laughs> Maybe we're both being scammed. But what I liked about what Robert Briscoe had to say is they said, are you, which were you first, Jewish or Irish? And he said, but I'm both. How could I separate one from the other? That's who I am. And that was, so, he also had that Irish sensibility that I know so well, because my family's all from Ireland, of kind of playing, oh, dismissing big things. Oh, don't fuss. Like my mother had a heart attack recently. Why do I have to make a such a big deal, little, little incident? So, you know, he's writing about these incredible things he did about being chased by uh, the British because they're on to him being a gun runner. Hell, we go through this house now and we just disappear at the backyard. Oh, we're no better for the wear. You know, we're worse for the wear. You're like, what? He was just got killed. Like, what are you talking about? Well, I think there are a few things to comment about that. I think the Irish, um, and you'd appreciate this being a comedian, uh, their wit is very self deprecating. And I think that comes from being occupied for so long, right? And anyone who got kind of full of themselves, you get you shoot them right down. We call it slagging, right? Um, it, which which is done in a lighthearted, fun way. But it's like, don't get too full of yourself, right? Oh my God. Um, uh, the other thing I think after talking with David, his grandson, who you met, um, I think Robert Briscoe's grandson, David, is now a doctor, a pediatric head of something at Harvard, um, Robert Briscoe's grandson. Yeah. Um, in talking with him, I think that um, Robert wasn't exposing all the secrets, you know, in that book, right? He, he wasn't going to expose, you know, obviously this book was written after the war, but, you know, if you were in the IRA, you wouldn't be telling how you did it, right? So I think that there's some of that in the book too. To kind Important of to know, yes, the IRA, he was part of the Irish Republican Army, a freedom fighter before I Ireland became the 26 uh, free counties. Uh, just was because he could speak German, he was able to go to Germany and uh, finagle, as they yeah. say, and make yeah. it happen. I just found it interesting too, I brought this up before, and it's not just particular to Robert Briscoe, but any of the Orthodox community in Ireland at that time, which thank you, Molly, called the Portobello area. Yes, yes, yes. Around South Circular Road, Valerie, which is where the... It is actually referred to as Little Jer Jerusalem still. Um, Little uh, Jerusalem. In an affectionate way by non-Jews too. Um, but I think about Orthodox Jews coming to literally the land of pork. I mean, it's literally... You know what I mean? It's just so funny to me, but they created their own kosher um, stores and restaurants. And they still, you know, the, um, yeah, predominantly the community is Orthodox, not all, but they abide by those strict traditions and import a lot of food that's kosher from other places. What were, do you know what were the, at the height, how many numbers of Jewish people were in um, Ireland? All told, um, not even 6,000, um, but uh, we Irish Jews punch above our weight. <laughs> I mean, it's not just in politics, but in the arts and um, the medical professions, lawyers, everything. You know, um, people have contributed in so many ways and still do. What do you think um, was contributed by the Jewish community to Ireland? Uh, well, as I just told, you know, just the Briscoe story, right, um, serving in politics and being part of the fight for freedom. But there is also a very interesting figure by the name of Isaac Herzog, who was the first chief rabbi 
of, this, of Ireland and later became the first chief rabbi of Israel. Um, he was very close with Eamon de Valera, the prime minister of the Tishuk. Um, de Valera sought out his, his counsel in um, weighty <clears throat> issues of the day. They even had a um, part of the Irish constitution recognizes um, religious minorities, including Judaism, Quakers, um, what else is in there? But uh, Rabbi Herzog was part of drafting that. Um, so in the arts, you see so many um, today, artists and um, filmmakers, um, everything. Really. Everything, yeah. yeah. It's really interesting to think about a Jewish man, but because he was Irish too, fighting alongside Michael Collins, working with Eamon de, Eamon de Valera, the longest serving prime minister or president of in Europe, I believe, like 50 years or something like that. I mean, just such a long time. And you just think about the times because this was before the, you know, the Irish freedom. I, I just find the whole thing so fascinating to me. Yeah. Uh, and having such a love of his country and a love of Israel, just to have both of those things within yourself. Well, you know, I asked the same question when I first met people about what's it like to be an Irish Jew and people look at me and after a while I stopped asking that question because it, it was ridiculous. It's sort of like someone saying to me, what is it like to be an American Jew? I mean, I don't dissect that. That's just who I am, right? I'm both. <laughs> you know, I don't choose one or the other. And so I realized after a while, you know, because people just look at me like, what do you mean? They didn't even know how to answer that question. It's, you know. Oh, yeah, you answered it like Briscoe did. But you know what, too, though, Valerie? And I mean, I, well, I don't know if I've asked you that specifically, but you're, you have become an expert on it because of this movie and what you've done. Because I think people don't expect it. And it's such a conversation piece. Really, it is. And it's a way to open up a dialogue about Jews are everywhere and everyone. And I, I love that. Well, and I also want to comment on uh, what you said about the stereotypes at the beginning, because, you know, um, actually Michael felt kind of uncomfortable with that stereotype about the, the Joe saying that the Irish Jews drink more than anyone else. And actually, yeah. that's what I like about that. It sort of turns stereotypes on their head. And in all my work, I look at those things like, um, how do you really, ex what are stereotypes? Well, well, negative ones, right? Sometimes stereotypes can be good, but um where do they come from, and how do you how do we break those down? Um, because that's that's what how do we get to eradicating hate, and that's about getting to know each other, right? And I feel so fortunate, like not having grown up with this culture. I used to say that I adopted it, but now I actually feel like I'm Irish, right? Um, and that's because of a lot of research that was done since the making of the film. Um, I actually found, have found that I'm, my family was pretty well established in Ireland. For, really? Uh, yeah. So, so talk to you, I'm going to take a break, uh, just a quick little, um, this is my little commercial break, Valerie, and then we're going to get back. This is my high tech commercial break. Bear with, bear with. Um, hear ye, hear ye. Hanging with Lang and brings all of my shows to you for free because I'm all about love because why wouldn't I do this for you? But if you're inclined, you know, um, to support the show, we always say pay what you can or what you want. Nothing too big, nothing too small. And you can do that simply at paypal.me uh, or Venmo at Molangen, paypal.me forward slash Molangen and uh, Venmo at Molangen. If you are also inclined, this would be wonderful. If you wanted to subscribe on Patreon, uh, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Maureen Langan, I bring you gifts. I come bearing gifts. You can get at different levels. You can get the Don't Make Me Hate You t-shirt right over my shoulder. Uh, you can get all the video chats because we put all the audio on all the major podcast platforms, but you get all the audio. I put backstage chats and bonus chats. and We, we can do so many cool things, wine parties. There's so many things that we can do. And that starts at five bucks a month. And then you're supporting the show and great guests that I bring to you because that's what I do. Uh, there's interviews up there with Alan Zweibel, uh, the original uh, Saturday Night Live writer, Jessica Kirsten, Vic DiPetetto, great comics. Uh, just so many good stuff that you could get there. And also, I recently interviewed Christine. Well, her name is Sandra Joseph, and she played Christine in Phantom of the Opera for 10 years on Broadway, the longest-running leading lady in the longest-running uh, play show on Broadway. So if you're so inclined, again, it's Patreon, Molangen, and Venmo, Molangen, um, and PayPal. So 
Thank you, guys. Um, period, period. What I'm going to do is get back to Valerie Lappin, my guest, here to talk about the Irish Jewish community in um, Dublin and beyond in Ireland. And I'm going to replay a little clip that started it off because some of you didn't get right in. That's Robert Briscoe, who we were speaking of, the Lord Mayor of Dublin, a gun runner. He did it all. Uh, people having their weddings in, in Ireland, the Jewish community. Look at this, Dublin Hebrew Com Congregation, Irish Jewish Museum. Look at all these cool photos. And of course, Kosher Guinness, who doesn't want that? <laughs> or just... In Hebrew, I don't know if it's kosher. What do I know? Oi, what do I know from kosher? I think I'm more Jewish than most people because I'm from New York City. So I would say I'm Jewish. That's right. Little Jerusalem is what that area was called. And that's what Valerie said. All right, we're going to play this little clip from Shalom, Ireland. It's part of the trailer. And this is the famous Robert Briscoe's son, Joe, talking about his father coming from his grandfather, coming from Lithuania's grandparents settling in Dublin and giving birth to this chap and so many others. My father used to say that Jews had the facility of picking up the best qualities of the wider community in which they lived. Uh, for instance, uh, the German Jews were inclined to be a bit arrogant. Uh, the British Jews were inclined to be a bit pompous. Uh, the American Jews were inclined to be a bit boastful. And he said the Irish Jews were the friendliest Jews in the world. They also, unfortunately, drank more than any other Jews. Valerie, I had wanted to replay that the stereotypes the Irish Jews. I just got a message here, Valerie. Her, um, Herbert Wolftone, Herb Briscoe, is watching nephew of Robert. Oh, nice. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Oh, where where are you, Herbert? We'd love to know where you are. Just uh, put it in the comments. Where do you live? I want to know everything. So, Valerie, your grandparents, you found out, unbeknownst to you, how did you know? Were they your great grandparents? Yeah. So, you know, as I was saying, um, we went to visit the Irish Jewish Museum. And a few months after I got home, my dad called one day and said, We have a cousin who's a genealogist, and she has discovered that my great grandparents, my dad's grandparents, were married in Waterford. And um, she sent over a few documents. And I was like, Are you kidding me? You know, my dad didn't believe it at first. And so I wrote to the Irish Jewish Museum, and one morning I get a call from Joe Morrison, who you just met, the docent, the volunteer docent. He said his he was from Limerick, his mother was from Limerick. He had a and her name was Lappin, just like mine. And he had an uncle who lived in Waterford around the same time that my family did. We never figured out exactly what the connection was, but Joe and I decided we were cousins. And, you know, if any of the uh, Morrison's family is on today, hello, shout out. Um, shout out to Rebecca, daughter of Joe Morrison. Oh, good, Rebecca's on. Hi, Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca, Rebecca ha has a very short cameo in the film. <laughs> is Rebecca coming to us from Ireland? Um, Rebecca, you're in Isra Israel now, I think, right? Same thing. Yeah. Oh, my God. This is so insane. We're going to get back to your story. A gal I went to high school with, Mary Gartner. I love Mary. We went to high school together. That's her uncle, Herb. Um, from My friend from Lake Liss, Hiawatha. There's no lake in Lake Hiawatha. That's her uncle. This is all coming together, you guys. Maureen Langan and Valerie are bringing together all the Irish, all the Jews from across the fruited plain and internationally. <laughs> All right. So you don't know you have these great grandparents who are Irish, who live in Waterford, who are doing pretty darn well for themselves. Good for them. What were they doing? What was their life like there in Waterford? Well, they had a shop where they sold furniture and draperies, and mm -hmm. um, which was pretty common for Jews to do around that time. Um, really? A lot of Jewish people would do what they call pedal around the countryside. They take their wares around and um, sell them. Um, my great grandparents were actually pretty well established in social circles in Waterford. I'm going to, I'm looking at some notes because this is some research that came about um, in recent years. You'll remember Maureen, when we were at the 
Irish Arts and Writers Festival when we first met. Um, there was when I first met you when I was performing at the Irish Writers Festival. Yeah, and I was there because um, I had been contacted by a man named Kieran Cronin from the Waterford Institute of Technology. They were in the process of bringing over an exhibition called Representations of Jews in Irish Literature. And some scholars in Ireland had done extensive, deep research into this. And they took this dog and pony show on the road and they um, created some museum panels to go with this, this research. Um, Kieran contacted me because they were bringing it to the Waterford Institute of Technology. And he uh, wanted to include a local angle and wanted to tell the story of my family. So turns out Kieran is a very talented researcher, knows a lot about genealogy research, and he dove in and found out all sorts of things about my family that I didn't know. Um, he, <laughs> you'll appreciate this. I'm going to read, read this part because I want to get this right. Um, on the occasion of the royal visit to Ireland in 1885, my, my great uncle, William, wrote a letter to the editor of the local newspaper demanding a retraction because his name had been included in a list of Waterford citizens testifying their loyalty to their royal highnesses, the prince and princess of Wales, on this visit they were making to Ireland, right? Um, and so he, he demanded a retraction because he had not agreed to that. So it appears that um, there were some rebels in my family. <laughs> I love it. Well, their Irish and rebels tend to go together, don't they? Right. But, but you know, there were Jews on all, sorts, all ends of the, the spectrum when it came to the, <laughs> Of course. Of the, course. And to speak out and write a letter and be that prominent and make a show of yourself. <laughs> in fact, Robert Briscoe's father-in-law was a loyalist, right? So they had some co conflicts around that, right? So um, yeah, I mean, it was like like in civil war, war, right? Brothers are sometimes on the opposite side. So I know that is heartbreaking. Uh, I understand that Robert Briscoe's sister became a nun. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Well, when in Rome, um, but you know, I feel like people marry people from different faiths. People become different faiths. People embrace different faiths. You know, it's all just about how, isn't religion about teaching you how to love, right? And we just do it in different ways. <laughs> isn't that what it should be about? It's a really lovely way to put it. It's really a lovely way to put it, Nellie. Um, gosh, there's so much. So you discover your grandparents, they're doing well. You discover this Irish community and, um, well, there's so many things I want to talk to you about this. Talk to me about the, we got only touched a little bit about <clears throat> the Belfast area and Amy Rychek, she's watching. Hi, Amy. <laughs> Hi, Amy. And again, her, I went to high school with her brother and she lives out in San Francisco. This is so insane how everybody's coming together on this show. I love it. So many cool comments. Why people are saying I'm trying to listen. I guess they, one person, he, I think they got in. I don't know why there was an issue for a couple of people. Um, talk to me about the rabbis and the connection again to Ireland and then why they left uh, and went to Israel, like that whole story. I don't know that rabbi. Well, I mean, I know of him, of course, but I don't know much about Rabbi Herzog. I know he, yeah. he's well, Her Rabbi Herzog, yeah. Well, I mean, he was a renowned um scholar of the Talmud. Yeah. He was very well respected internationally as a rabbi. So um, it's quite, it was quite an honor to be asked to become the uh, chief rabbi of Palestine and later Israel. So, you know, it's sort of like, how do you pass up that opportunity? right? <laughs> you know? mm. um, but interestingly, his son Chaim became president of Israel, right? Um, so there's quite a big Irish um, Jewish community in Israel. I met a quite a few folks when I was there showing the film. Really? And, oh, we had a great time. <laughs> it was a great hooey. Yeah. Um, the Irish ambassador brought uh, cases of Ir the good stuff, the good Irish whiskey that we had at this film screen. It was a lot of fun. And there were some um, musicians playing Irish music there in Jerusalem. It was wonderful. Yeah. I love the sessions when people just get together with their instruments and put, put together a little bit of a hooey. Um, what did you find? Well, you're talking about being in Israel and finding a large Irish contingent. So you mean now they're Jewish. They've been born and raised in Israel, but they came from an Irish background. Similar. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 You know, people wanted to, to, um, make Aliyah and, you know, go to Israel, live in Israel, be part of the creation of that country. So yeah, there's a pretty big Irish community in, in Israel. 
What are some of the things? And Rebecca, you know, if we could get Rebecca. <laughs> We're Rebecca, living in Israel now. I would love to see if we could get, I don't, you know, this, I do my own technology here. I'm like Silicon Valley uh, on my own, just chucked to the wolves in this crazy <laughs> pandemic. Um, I've pivoted. I have pivoted. I'm just looking at some of the comments. Rebecca is there and Herb and Mary. I feel like the romper room lady, my friend Molly here. I see Amy. I was on romper room. <laughs> That's my claim to fame. You know, I grew up in Hollywood. I was on romper room. Sorry, but I digress. Well, no, but my friend Molly was the romper room lady in New York and New Jersey. Oh, really? Yes. There's a lot. It's all coming together. <laughs> uh, my friend Robert Miller um, is watching too. I had... A Seder, was it called a Seder? I believe at his house, you know, the, the, the when the sun goes down, you eat a nice meal, right? That's a Seder. It doesn't have to be just a special holiday. You have one on a Friday. Well, it's for Passover. Oh, and what did I have with the meal? With the you, huh? had Shabbat, you had a Shabbat meal. I had a Shabbat meal. Yeah. So I had a Shabbat meal at my friend Robert Miller and Sarah Lee Kessler's home. And before I left, I used the restroom, washed my hands, and then I shut off the lights thinking I was being polite, shutting off the lights, but uh -huh. they can't put them back on because they're modern Orthodox and the lights have to stay off. So they okay. could sleep all the, the whole next day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's my fault, I'm sorry. Uh, what surprised you? Because when I was at the museum, you know, the, the Irish Jewish Museum, my friends, when I was there, and some of it, of course, it's so fun to see the little details that you didn't know about the Guinness beer that's in Hebrew. But some of the things just struck me so painfully about the children um, escaping World War II. And they were given a bit of a respite, I understand. They were allowed to come to Ireland. I'm just picking a number, say six months. But then they were going to be sent back once they weren't in supposedly in danger anymore. I read something about that. Well, so, you know, some of them actually came to America. Um, so. It was actually, it was a humanitarian effort. And I think that the people who were part of that look back on that fondly. You know, oh, they sure. started a farm in uh, Northern Ireland, they were on a farm. Um, so yeah, there were some efforts. Um, Briscoe worked very hard to try to bring more Jewish people to Ireland, but um, you know, just Ireland was reeling, right? This was shortly after they'd won independence, right? It, the, there was a lot of poverty, um, migration away from Ireland. So um, I'm not saying this is an excuse, but it's just like Ireland, you know, no, no country was taking in Jews except for like uh, the, the Cuba, I think, and the Dominican Republic, or China. China took in a fair number of Jews, but America mm -hmm. had a disgraceful record on that. Um, you know, the, I, uh, Roosevelt was turning Jews away during the Holocaust, right? You know, so I don't think that it was uh, an issue of anti-Semitism per se, um, but I don't know, maybe the audience will correct me. Um, so you think it was, um, you think it was economic, but it always is. And then we, you know, we always turn people away. I mean, you know, De Valera, De Valera got, has gotten a lot of criticism for not taking in more Jews. Um, you know, Ireland was neutral during the war. Um, so, you know, as a small country, didn't really have a military or much of a navy, right? right. Um, and it was in a very sensitive, strategic part place in the world, right? Um, you know, having said that, you know, the, the, the Americans were, you know, were landing there and using, you know, it was kind of like a lot of wink, wink, nod, nod, you know, but when... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not articulating this very well. Oh, you are, you are. I'm getting you. I'm getting you. But you know, it, it still is kind of a controversial issue to this day. You know, what what country did do um, right by the Jews? Right by it, right? You know, are we doing right by people in Yemen today or um, other parts of the world? Syria, you know, South um, America, America, Mexico, Central America, right? We yeah, just, that's also meant, yeah, Central America. You were talking earlier, Valerie, about the depiction of uh, Jewish people in, in Irish literature. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. what was the overall portrayal? I'm not, I'm not much of an expert on this. This is another show. You should have some of these scholars on. Apparently, like, the character of uh, um, vamp vampires were based on negative stereotypes. That's one that I remember from that. 
Um, you know, of course, there's Shylock and, and Shakespeare. That's not Irish, but the, well, let's pretend it is. <laughs> yeah, um, but appa apparently the vampires come came from um, who's the one that Dracula uh, Brown is the author. Okay. Um, sorry, don't know my horror story. History. I don't know horror stories, but um, I'm going to move on to another couple topics. But there you go, folks. That's Robert Briscoe who was the Lord Mayor of Dublin, gun runner, just a little bit of a gun runner, IRA, freedom fighter, that's it. A few little things like that. His father set up a furniture store and I understand some meat stores and he was quite the entrepreneur, but out of necessity in Dublin. And I hope you guys get to go to the Irish Jewish Museum at some point or just even Google it and research it. I think you'll be fascinated by what's in there. And I just think it's so cool to go upstairs there if you ever can and see the synagogue that they have where they would pray. It's just, I remember the clock. I, there's something interesting about the clock that was up there. I'll have to sort that out, but go there if you can. It's such a, a worthwhile place and definitely do some research on that. You brought up something, Valerie, that really interested me. I want to go back to that. Abraham Bram Stoker was an Irish author best known today for his 1897 Gothic horror novel, Dracula. Thank you, Mr. Bobito. <laughs> I love when people weigh in, you guys. It's so much fun to get your comments and anything you know. Like, this is for you, this show. We all connect. And again, you want to support the show. Uh, they're all for free. But uh, but if you want to pay what you can or, or want to any amount, it just keeps the show going at PayPal and Venmo at Molangan. And if you want to subscribe, starting at 5 bucks a month to Patreon.com and at different levels, I'll get you a Don't Make Me Hate You t-shirt that's over my shoulder because you don't want to hate people. They make you hate them. You are a victim. Uh, Valerie, you brought up you brought up being in Israel. I, I'm going back to this again. Uh, what I want you to know about is, oh, you're giving a shout out. You want to know about representations of Jews in Irish literature. There's you anybody. Can, you can Google that and you can find more information about the work. It's this work is still ongoing. I, the, there's going to be a book published about it soon, but um yeah, some good stuff. Here. Can you and I please go? Can you and I? Can you and I just please? Oi, go to. Can we go to um, work on a documentary together in Europe? I'm a very good researcher. I was a journalist for many years. I'll go do comedy gigs around Europe at night. I have the passport, the Irish passport. And then you'll say, Maureen, go research this topic for me. And I'll be like, yeah, I'll help you. I got detail. I'm good at that. Like, that's well, a big thing. Jam. Well, Coincidentally, the work, the project I'm working on right now is very early stages, but it will most likely bring us to Europe, not Ireland, but um, oh, Berlin and Budapest. How's, how about Berlin and Bu Budapest? I think you'd go over great in Berlin with your stand up. Have you well, ever? Been and been, sorry, I have not been there, though. I did meet a club owner uh, who owns a club in Berlin when I was in Switzerland doing a gig. This sounds so uppity, but it's just fun. At least, see, that's the Irish thing. This sounds so uppity. Don't brag. My mother always said, don't make a show of yourself. And what do I do for a living? I make shows of myself. <laughs> um, no, but I, I would go for uh, pennies on the dollar to research stuff for you. I swear. Well, I actually, uh, Maureen, I do need your help on this because there's a little bit of comedic element that, I'll, that we'll have to talk about. I'll, I need your help in sussing this part of the story out. I know. And you're probably thinking, can I afford Maureen? Is this too much? Is she serious? I don't know if she is, she is and she will make this work for you. I just, you know what it is? I am so, I so miss that side of my brain. I love being funny. I love humor. I love wit, but I also love the other side. I love the balance of both the digging and the re I've been doing tons of genealogy. We have tons of it. I love it. Well, I, it's a puzzle because every time you find another piece, I found out my one uncle, my father's uncle came here and he fought. See, this is what people do from other countries. And this is so American. And I want to talk about this. They come from other countries. And my great uncle Jack came from Ireland, from County Westmeath, and served in the Spanish-American War. Really? Then he went on to serve in World War I. He was a career... Um, he had a career in the army and I just put up a headstone to him out in Queens because there was no headstone to him. And with women, and this isn't just, I, this is everywhere. 
you'll see the woman's first name, but you don't know her last name. You know nothing about her. So then I had to research his wife. I had to know more about her. Rose McGuire from County Cavan. I found out her father's James, her mother's Catherine Donahue. Donahue. I mean, but so that's one. The other brother who stayed there, and we're talking the early 1900s, um, he, and I didn't know anything about this, and I'm, I hope I, I'm going to probably say this wrong and embarrass myself, but he was a private with the Connaught Rangers. It, it's an Irish, C-O-N-N-A-U-G-H-T. I don't know how to pronounce that correctly. The Connaught Rangers, which was part of the British uh, military. Well, and, when was that? What? Uh, the early 1900s. Right. Well, that's what, you know, Ireland was part of the Britain then. Of right? course. Same of with my great uncle, um, fought in World War One as a, um, in the British army and was killed in France. And there's actually a memorial to him in Waterford as one of the sons that died during World War One. This is some of the research that Karen um, turned up. But Maureen, I think we may be related. You did you see me perk up when you said Westmead? Because my mm -hmm. husband's family is from Westmead. I mean, it's not a big place. Where right? are they from in Westmead? Drum Rainey. And I was there like five years ago. Well, my family well, is from Rath Conrath. Well, I'll have to talk connect with your husband. Rath Con and where is he from? I'm going to look that up. Westmead. Yeah, Drum but Rainey. Drum Rainey. Um, how do you spell that? D R U M R A. N E Y, I think. I'll look that up. <clears throat> I have it, this right here on the wall. If you have a question for Valerie or a comment, you can do that. Just comment here. Here's the map. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's a, you can't do there's reflection, but um, well, yeah, I, I can look up where your people are from. Wow. Yeah. I think we're related. Maureen. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> well, this is, okay. Well, I have two stories to tell you because, well, I, I want to tell you about that one in Pittsburgh. And then I want to tell you. When I hear in recent years that people should only come to America merit-based, what they can bring to this country, I think about, well, people come here uh, out of necessity. And I think about my father's parents came here and my father's, my grandfather had a sixth grade education. This is all according to the census and all the, I knew my grandfather and his mother had an eighth grade education. And then my father gets a civil service job working for the sanitation department, the union. That was considered really great. Um, and then my my siblings and I went to state colleges, affordable. Now my siblings' kids are going to you know university, uh, you know Northeastern and uh, Temple and uh, University of Pittsburgh and Seton Hall. So like, you come. My my grandfather was a um, longshoreman. You know like. People work like animals, so the next generation. So this merit-based, none of us would be here if it was only merit-based. Right, and, and that's that's really what makes America great, right? That's, that We all have that in our backgrounds, right? Our families came with nothing because they were escaping from the hunger, famine, um, persecution, wars. Mm -hmm. um, you, but when you have to leave a country you, you in, during those kinds of circumstances, you don't have much on your back, right? So you come here and... You imagine um, showing up, you're not here, you don't know the language. Of course, you're going to end up um, in these jobs where um, that, that are considered menial. But I also want to make the point, Maureen, when you talk about your family in Ireland not having education, Irish people, there's a very, very strong tradition of education and scholarship and in Ireland, whether people are edu go, go have formal education or not. I mean, you know, when you walk into a pub, you talk to anyone from any walk of life and they're knowledgeable. Um, I'm always impressed with that because I think they have a better education system there than we do here, frankly. But there was a time when if you were a Catholic in, in Ireland, you weren't allowed to have an education, right? Mm -hmm. There were the um, hedge, am I, am I saying this wrong? The the hedge schools where people would actually have schools out in fields in secret because it was illegal to speak Irish. Right. So I don't, I, you know, I think that we kind of can assume people weren't educated, but you have to kind of peel back the onions to really look at that. Right. I, I know. Yes. I hear what you're saying. It is a very smart, literary, sharp people, but I also think too, and I can only go by my own family, my mother's family, was more educated than my father's family, um, more schooled, uh, you know, just the way it was. But my mother's family, 
owned land. They own their own farm. Now, no matter how much you struggled, if you owned your own land, that was a lot. Mm -hmm. And they got educated. And I go far back and they're all educated. And they had a, they owned a quarry. They weren't rich, but they had comfort. My mother's one of 10 kids and her father died when she was 15. So I'm not saying they were living large, but they had the animals on the farm. They had the growth. My grandfather's um, family were tenant farmers. They had one acre of land. Mm -hmm. And if the potato famine, one acre of land and you're poor, very poor. So I don't know what was available to them versus what was available to my mother's family in terms of education. It's just very different sides of the family. But I find it also interesting. I did a gig, um, people are coming at us now in a good way with- uh, uh -oh, with, I can't call that on something. Do I say something wrong? No, they're talking about books, depictions of Jews and all. Oh yes, of course, Ulysses. Yeah. <laughs> And we'll, we'll do more of that chat um, <clears throat> another time. No, I, I agree with you. And in that area in particular, I, I spent a lot of time in Scotland. And I work with these, these texts that are 21, 22. What they know and what they read and what the references are are mind-boggling to me. You know, you know, I think it's funny. Um, you know, you get on Facebook those memories that come up this morning. And I thought of you, Maureen, because one year ago today, I put a picture of, the um, garbage cans out on the road, you know, the pandemic had just started and I made little care packages. I put chocolates in there for the garbage collectors. Cause I remember at that time they were really putting themselves in danger. We didn't really understand mm -hmm. how the virus was mm -hmm. spreading. And so, um, you know, when I think of your dad um, wow. being a garbage man and the essential work, that people provide and have provided to keep us going through this pandemic. Oh, wow, thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Also too, folks, think about this because my father was a sanitation worker. You know, you see them working in your neighborhood, bring out a bottle of water for them in the summer. Bring out some. Like they, these guys are out and gals, I mean, mostly men out on the streets, you know, offer them a bottle of water for God's sakes in, in July and August or whatever. I mean, I just think of, my parents do that. They'll see the fellas out there, here's some water. Um, a genealogy thing I wanted to bring up to you. My fella, we call him the Sicilian because his grandparents are from Sicily. I don't know if I've mentioned this to you, Valerie. Yes, you did. I know. <laughs> I love this. this story. So this is for the masses. Um, I did his gene. We did the ancestry.com and the pie chart comes back. And I think it's an example. Mine comes back 100% Irish in the Midlands. We didn't even visit Galway or Dublin. But his comes back. And he's half Jewish, half. His mother is a full Jew. And I go, your mother didn't tell you she was Jewish? He goes, no. Like, no. He was just like, what? And I said, don't worry. You had me at Shalom. Don't worry. The thing is, I did the research and his great-grandparents left Romania and Russia, settled in Pittsburgh. I get a cop in the 1880s. I get a copy of the 1910 census. They're still living there. And their next door neighbor, are you ready for this? I have it. It's right on the census. At 610 lives his family. At 608, Langan. No way. It's double dog swear. <clears throat> double dog <Wow>. swear. <clears throat> and now, of course, I have to research these Langans, so I get their Is information. We related to them. Have you we, figured out you're related to them? Um, I don't think we are, but, who, but you know, Langan isn't such a common name, so we'll figure this all out. I got back to, um, they came from Waterford, and... The interesting thing, this is what people, I want people to understand. So I find out what did this man do who came from Waterford in the 1860s? He was, and I thought I was misreading it, a puddler. And I'm like, a peddler? Like who goes to rural Pennsylvania outside of Pittsburgh to peddle their wares? <laughs> what do you got? Like a bit for the cow? Like what are you selling? I go, well, that makes no sense that he would be a peddler. It looks like a puddler. I look up puddler. I didn't know that was a, a trade. Have you ever heard of a puddler? You probably have. I didn't. Yeah, I hear you. peddler, but I have. I think I have heard of that before. Yeah. Well, a puddler, and this is I'm putting it in Maureen's rudimentary terms. They take one kind of metal and they turn it into another by putting it in the fire. You know how Pennsylvania became steel capital. They take some iron and once you make it hot, it becomes another kind of metal. I was I studied English. I don't know what that is. But is that what, the, what the travelers do in Ireland? The oh, the tinkers, they would fix yeah. your pots and pans. They would come to the farm, my mother said, and they'd fix your pots and pans. Yeah. This was different. They're in a heated 
flame infested area with this metal and their average age was 40 life expectancy because of all the soot and smoke. And I thought, how the hell bad is your life in Ireland that you come here and that's your job? Mm -hmm. That's a better life. Pretty insane. Well, now that well, they came right after the famine, then, right? So right. they were starving. Or as we say, the great hunger now, right? There really wasn't famine. The food was being exported to England. There was food in Ireland. That's what people don't, a lot of people don't understand. There was food. They just took it for, from them. And that's why when I hear people go, well, you should come to this country legally, apply, and wait to get your paperwork that says yes. I'm like, and I've heard Irish people say this. Well, we came legally. Well, okay, then the quotas were so much higher, or there were none at times. Well, it's arbitrary what's legal. It's whatever law you pass at the moment, right? It depends on who's in office, right? Well, uh, prior to um, the last administration, hundred we allocated 110 slots for, you know, give me your tired, your hungry, your poor, your huddled masses. Now I understand it's under 10,000. And this had nothing to do with the virus. This was pre-virus. Right, right. I, I said to some people, okay, so you're in a famine, you're trudging along in your bare thread clothing with your kids. And you're like, okay, let me fill out a little telegram. <laughs> I'd say, anybody get space for me in the Lower East Side? Um, you brought this up before, and I do want to go back to it before I let you go. I know I've held you longer than I said. I just am amazed, like when you went to Israel and met people of Irish descent, uh, yeah. Irish Jews now living in Israel, what did they have a lot of that same kind of music and culture and, or was it vastly different? Uh, well, a lot of the people I had met um, had recent, you know, been there for a few decades, but you know, they grew up and were raised in, in Ireland. So they spoke like they were Irish, right? Well, in Ireland, but I mean, in Israel. Yeah. I mean, in Israel. Yeah. Yeah. They would, many of the people I met had were born in Ireland oh, and oh, oh. in Israel. So, you know, yes, they had Irish accents when they spoke English. Oh, okay. I thought they were future generation. I got you. So there's, well, there's some of that too, but I met quite quite a few people who had actually who were born in Ireland in Israel. Did um, you see like Irish pubs and traditional music? Yeah, I mean, they love the Guinness. I mean, that's where it, that's what why um, kosher Guinness was made was for export to Israel, right? You don't. It was here. You go. A bottle of the. Look at this, you guys. Here's the bottle. I mean, you see, you see Guinness. I just all disappeared over. myself, but I'm back. Let's bring Valerie back in. There. She Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> I mean, I can you hear me, Maureen? <laughs> Technology, Valerie, you're making me insane. You're doing um, great. You're doing great. Listen, this is what's out there. This is not me. These are the the ether, the programs, the stream art. But listen, you have been so wonderful to spend this kind of time with me, and I want people to know that they can follow you at. Um, oh no, you're back, Sarah. We're back. We are so, she said, you're so knowledgeable. And that was from Sarah. And she's very happy. That <laughs> so we're here. My childhood friend. <laughs> my childhood friend. So uh, your production company, Share.Productions, is where people can learn more about you. Yeah. yeah. And I would like you to give a quick shout out to your other film, which is fascinating. Long oh, Ride Home. Long Ride, yeah. The Long Ride, again, another story of immigration. It's about the- Is um, it The Long Ride or The Long Ride Home? The long ride, um, but that's an honest mistake because I 
used the music from Michael Franti and Spearhead to in the open, and that song is called Long Ride Home. So wow. easy mistake to make. Um, yeah, it's about the birth of the new civil rights movement for immigrant workers here in the U.S. So, um, yeah, I have a trend here of immigration stories. <laughs> Another great flick that Maureen Langan watched and interviewed Valerie on KGO, my former radio station, where the program director never listened to my show and had no idea that I had a background in journalism. It doesn't matter. There's no bitterness. So um, thank you, my cousin Kathy Cunningham. Very positive um, program. Going to look up loads of links about you. You know, you guys, thank you for watching because when I have people like Valerie on, I try to bring you the best guests possible who have something to offer. We have a good time. We chat. We relax. And one more shout out, if I may, uh, shameless Maureen Langan plugs. But we'll take your comments. Don't, you don't have to go away just yet. Please go to Patreon and support the show. Get a Hangout with Langan t-shirt. Um, you know, there's a lot of fun stuff there. And you keep the shows coming. And you can join as simply at five bucks a month. Or you say, you know, we just want to make a one-time donation. I, I think about you and I love you so much. Sure, PayPal or Venmo, at Mo Lang. And you, I give you these shows for free, but also pay what you can, and that keeps them going. Valerie, oh, Mary Gartner, thank you for watching. She says, Valerie and Maureen, she really enjoyed the show. Uh, Joy Diamond is bitter with me. <laughs> An enlightened discussion. So good. People really enjoyed this. And you guys, I'm going to put you in the green room, Valerie, and say a proper goodbye and see when I'm meeting you in Berlin. And um, next week, we're going to chat more. I think I'm going to see if I can get Professor Peter Bales to join me. We have a lot of stuff to talk about, but I'll line up. I always line up great guests for you. So until we meet again, and follow me on all the dot coms. Follow me here, Hangin' with Langen, and uh, <clears throat> the Facebook, and the Instagram, and of course, of course at Patreon. All right, talk to you soon. Bye, Wig. Mwah.